All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see you all. And uh, I really appreciate the church giving me this opportunity to uh, to share a little bit of the uh, missionary experience that I got to uh, um, had a privilege of of being on this uh, May and June. And so uh, we're going to share a little bit of that uh, with you today. Obviously, with the time that we have, I'm going to go over things really quick and fast uh, to a point. Um, but there's definitely more I can share and, and happy to talk with you on it if you have questions or anything afterwards or down the way um, as we're around. But uh, before I get going, let's just go ahead and open in a word of prayer. And uh, I hope that this is truly a blessing to all of us and encouragement as we look to uh, serve the Lord wherever he has us. So um, let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning and this time that we have to, to get together and to look at, uh, at what you're doing around the world. Lord, it's truly um, you. And sometimes in this world, we get to, it's easy to get caught up with what, what's going on with us right here at home and to miss out on, on the great work of redemption that is happening around the world, calling to yourself people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And we just marvel at your grace towards us. And uh, we, we are so encouraged in what you're doing. May this be a, a morning that we, we glorify your work around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, at the start of the summer, uh, I had the privilege of going to, to uh, Gabon in Africa. And uh, this was through, the, uh, through my uh, tr schooling at Letourneau University. And so it actually was a part of my curriculum and it turned out to be a tremendous privilege. And uh, so we're gonna share a little bit of that with you guys and how that came about. Um, I had the, I'm in the mission aviation program there at Letourneau. And so I had to be uh, uh, involved with a mission aviation organization to some capacity. So today we're doing, uh, we're looking at Aviation Medical de Bungalow, which is an organization, it's a very small organization serving the Bungalow Hospital in uh, Gabon, Africa. But before uh, I get going too much, I mean, it, it's, it's just, we can't start anything about missions without going back to the Great Commission. And uh, throughout the Gospels, we have uh, the, uh, Christ giving us the commission and this is from Matthew 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So <clears throat> as we look at the uh, great commission that Christ gave us, one thing that always stands out to me his, uh, Jesus' final words to his disciples was to go and make disciples. And uh, this is not a command that is just meant for certain believers. It's not just meant for our pastors or for our teachers or for certain people within, but it really is to the entire church that we go and make disciples wherever God puts us. Uh, often, I grew up, uh, my parents were missionaries overseas. I grew up uh, overseas, and uh, so I, I was... This was always at the forefront of my life. But for many of us, we'll never leave our home, but the call is not uh, any less or, or, or for us at home. But that Christ has put, it, put the call on us that wherever we're at, we are to be making disciples, to be sharing within, within the sphere of influence that he has given us. And so... Um, really just an important thing to go back to. And especially in this day and age, we come out of a, a time when there's been, you know, following lockdowns and all that. I think we need a renewed appreciation for this call of Christ on our lives and, and for obedience to that. Um, I wrote down that the Great Commission is a natural act of obedience to Christ's command and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is not solely for evangelical missionaries, but to all of us who are disciples of Jesus. And I truly believe that. And it begins within those spheres of influence that God has given us. Sarah and I believe it begins in our home. It begins with our children. And from there, it moves out to those other 
realms of influence that Christ gives us um, that we make disciples um, by sharing the gospel and, and influencing people uh, for the gospel of Jesus. While most of us will not serve in traditional missionary roles, the, the, the Great Commission is still a command to all of us. So <clears throat> that being said, I gotta try and get this to move here. That being said, I just want to—I don't want to spend too much time on on uh, my personal story, but it kind of lays the background to why we're um, at and why I ended up out in Gabon this summer. But um, over the last few years, I, I recently retired from the Air Force. Most of you know that. And uh, over the last few years, as we just started looking at where the Lord would have us be involved, um, we really. I personally, as I was studying through the Bible and reading through Matthew, this continually came up for me. I, uh, there's so much to share that I'm kind of skipping over things, but some, some areas of influence that really meant a lot to me is as you go through the Sermon on the Mount, verses like um, Jesus saying, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we live in a, a society where so much we can get distracted by so many other things. and. Um, the importance of, of focusing on Christ and walking with him can become so um, distracted and pulled away um, from what we should really be about. And I, I found myself having to examine my own personal life. What, what am I treasuring? What is uh, truly valuable? And am I truly going in the direction that the Lord would have me to go? And so uh, looking at that, another account that a lot of folks maybe even miss in a, in, a, in a call to missions, but was the account of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. And as you go through that, Jesus called him, said, come follow me. And, and, and it's kind of a sad story because it, it tells us of a young man who turns away because he had many possessions. And so that really impacted me. It was, it was something I looked at and all of a sudden I was like, am I, am I doing the same thing in my own life? Am I ignoring the call of obedience to Christ because of other things that have a greater influence on me? And so these are, this is a quick run through, but these are things that even um, as we approach our lives and our walk with Christ, we need to, um, to reflect in obedience to, to our Lord on these things? Are we truly following um, what he would have for us? Or are there other things that are uh, distracting us from going where he wants us to go? Um, in all of this, this is a, I'm running through a two year period in a, in a matter of minutes um, because that's not really what this whole uh, lesson is about today. But um, it, it culminated, I, I had the privilege of wa watching the movie, The Ends of the Earth movie that recently came out. Uh, it was a, it's a documentary that uh, the Mission Aviation Fellowship um, put out. And basically it follows the storyline of this tribal work in Papua where the, the, the folks came to know the Lord and they immediately were impacted with the need to take the gospel across the valley to their neighbors. They could see their neighbors on the other side of the valley, but they couldn't get there because of the jungle and all that. And so the story follows that, but just their um, desire that having received the gospel and, and having come to know Christ, their desire was to share Christ with others. And uh, that really um, had a massive impact on my own life. We had, Sarah and I had actually been pers pursuing missions as soon as, um, I retired, but for some reason doors had closed and then COVID hit and everything shut down. And, and uh, I was sitting there and I really believe there was this moment, it, it, it just felt like the Lord was saying, now is the time to go, Chad. And so it's neat because within a month period, um, a scholarship came in for Letourneau. All these doors just opened up and that's why we moved so quickly from having a job at Barksdale to um, being a full-time student at Letourneau. I remember sitting down with Sarah and I'm like, I don't know that we can afford this. And we started working out the budget and, and uh, looking at everything. And through this scholarship and uh, my GI Bill benefits, we looked and everything had just lined up that at least for now, God has provided us a way 
because that's how God works. <laughs> so, needless to say, on May 20th, I found myself sitting on an Air France flight headed to uh, Gabon. It's a 19-hour trip uh, from Dallas-Fort Worth to um, through Paris and then down to uh, Libreville uh, via Paris Charles de Gaulle. Um, so just to give you a few quick notes on Gabon, um, the first time I said it in church, a lot of people didn't even know where that was because it really isn't a country that you hear a whole lot about. So I provided a map there. It is located in Central Africa, um, right there on the Atlantic coast. The equator runs directly through uh, just kind of north of the center of the country. So a uh, very tropical uh, climate. Um, I mentioned that I grew up in Africa. I grew up in West Africa. If you go up to the west coast, the furthest west point is Senegal. That's uh, where I grew up and then down around uh, a little bit uh, on the southern part of that hump that comes out is Cote d'Ivoire. Needless to say, um, Gabon is a lot different from those parts of Africa that I'd grown up in, so it was really uh, interesting for me. The, uh, the uh, tongue spoken or the trade language in Gabon is, is French, and so I had that familiar background because I grew up in French-speaking uh, West Africa. But um, a few stats is close to the size of uh, Colorado. It's not a massive country. It has a population of about 2 million. And uh, of that population, about 700,000 of them live in actual Libreville. So as so, uh, you get out into the... Um, the rest of the country is very sparse. Um, it was a French colony until 1960, and then uh, and, and it maintains close ties to France and uh, has uh, French as its trade language. Um, to the north, you have Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon, and then to the south, you have the uh, Republic of the Congo, which is the small Congo, and then further south of that is the, the what they refer is uh, the big Congo, the, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But uh, that gives you a little geography of where it was, uh, where it's located and where I went. Uh, my specific uh, trip was to the, more to the south of the country. We were literally uh, only a few, uh, maybe 15 miles from the uh, Congo border. So um, that's where I ended up. And just to give you a little, uh, idea of where it was. I did some screenshots on my phone one morning because Africa has changed a lot from when I was a kid. You couldn't do this, but now even way out in the middle of the jungle, you can still uh, get some cell phone service and Wi-Fi, which is quite funny from the days when I grew up, when you were out there, you were out there. So um, that gives you an idea of where it was. Uh, the bungalow hospital sits right on, uh, next to the Loetsi River, and uh, that's where I spent my time. I arrived in Libreville on Saturday, May 21st. I departed for uh, Lubamba, which is uh, the, the nearest town to the bungalow hospital, on uh, the next, uh, that Sunday, actually, the next day. And we took a 10-hour drive down by road because the airplane was broke. And um, it was good. I got an experience of some of the worst roads I've ever experienced. And I thought I'd already experienced some pretty bad roads. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, really good. We ended up down there uh, right next to the Loetsi River. Um, just to give you an idea of the topography, when I say it's jungle, that is it. It is jungle, jungle, jungle. And lumber is one of the main industries there. But they also, Gabon has a very uh, strong program to also uh, maintain, so they limit uh, over um, forestation or deforest. They, they, they see it as uh, a vital part of their economy. And so um, they have restrictions on how much jungle can be <laughs> chopped down. But as you can see from that photo alone, it's just how dense it is. Uh, really was interesting. That river to the there on the other side, that is the river that the original missionaries that went to bungalow way back in the day before there was even a thought of a hospital. That's the river that they took to get down there. <laughs> and as you can see, it would be quite 
Um, it seems like it would be quite a long journey. There's uh, rapids along the way and different things that, I, um, that would be obstacles to their transportation. Um, this is uh, the bungalow hospital. Uh, it is not anything fancy by American standards, but this hospital has such a high standard uh, in Gabon that there are people who travel there from all over Africa um, to, to uh, get service there. And uh, one of the things I've kind of been uh, going through, I need to get myself caught up with notes, but um, the, uh, the Bangalore Hospital is, uh, is associated with the Christian Missionary Alliance. It has uh, been there since 1977. It started out way back originally, um, there was just a small nursing dispensary there that was associated with the original missionary work that was done there in reaching the people in that region of Africa. And in 1977, they, there was, uh, they could see there was a need uh, for a hospital, and so um, they stepped out and, and uh, built a hospital or started working on a hospital, and it's, uh, it's grown over the years. They have, um, they have an eye clinic along with a, a whole um, source of things that they're uh, uh, able to do there now, uh, where back in the day it started out, I think it was just one doctor and one nurse. <laughs> and so it's uh, become quite a facility. Um, the mission of the Bangalore Hospital is to see God glorified as people are healed, saved, equipped, and sent. Um, it began uh, as a nursing dispensary over 70 years ago and today serves over 40,000 patients a year. Um, one thing that is uh, really neat that's happening at this uh, hospital, they, they are part of the uh, PACS program, which is the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. So um, what's happening here is they are training up uh, Christian doctors and nurses to be surgeons and nurses across the continent of Africa. It's very much what we're talking about. They're turning, um, if, if you walk around this facility, you're not going to find a whole bunch of, bunch of American missionaries. The people that are there are there to teach uh, the local believers. And I use that term loosely because I met Africans there from Guinea, from Zimbabwe, from all over Africa who have come there for training so that they can go back to their uh, countries and uh, serve Christ in the medical field across Africa. Um, one person I met there that was really inspiring to me was uh, Dr. Solomon. Dr. Solomon grew up in, uh, in Zimbabwe and uh, he was there uh, during like many, uh, many countries, Zimbabwe went through you know, evil dictators like a lot of the uh, African countries have struggled with. Had a rough growing up. He uh, was an orphan, um, wanted to be in medical, didn't have any money. Someone provided a source for him, so he was able to go. He went to Algeria for medical school. He had to learn French and Arabic. He already spoke English and Swahili. Anyhow, I met this man, a very humble man, and he could speak like 10 languages fluently. <laughs> it was quite something. Very impressive in his desires to go back. Um, he, he's actually finishing up the surgeon program there and will be headed back to uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, he was going to work in a, a smaller clinic in Zimbabwe. Um, I'm very excited to do that. Um, I included a couple of uh, photos from the air real quick and uh, this was actually on my last day uh, as I was flying out of out of there uh, I actually got to see more of the facility than I'd ever seen because there's so much jungle around there and it's quite hilly which doesn't really come up in these aerial photos much of this was difficult to see ge geographically until uh, I flew out over it and saw it all um, there. But it kind of gives you an idea of the hospital compound up there in the top. And then uh, in the lower one, you can see how the Luetze River goes along through there. Uh, kind of a dramatic story, but the people that originally um, in that area, there's a, a, a cliffs to the uh, top of that photo uh, near the falls on the Luetze River, 
the people that lived there uh, back in the, in the day before they came to know Christ, when things weren't going well, they would throw someone off those cliffs as a sacrifice to their gods. And uh, one comment that was shared while I was there is that they realized that uh, when they were faced with the destructive nature of sin and the need for a sacrifice, that was actually not very hard for them to comprehend. Um, but it's, uh, it's a marvelous thing to go through there and see how many have come to know Christ uh, through the work of, of missionaries and now the bungalow hospital in that area as well. Um, so I went out to serve with the uh, with Aviación Medical de Bangalore. It's a very small organization. They operate one aircraft and they have two pilots. <laughs> it's not a major. Uh, um, it's not one of the big ones like MAF or Jars or whatnot. They had actually asked, uh, reached around the hospital, had. Um, reached out to these larger organizations to see if they would be able to support something like that and most of them came back and in their uh, plan it just the operation was too small to fit within the guidelines of MAF or someone like that. And so uh, the hospital actually made an attempt in the early 2000s to start their own program but uh, when you get a bunch of surgeons and medical doctors around they didn't really know too much about aviation they got to a hangar built, um, they got someone out there and they got a small Zenith airplane which is a two-seater uh, airplane that's great for short field takeoff and that's about it, really couldn't carry much and sadly on their first day of operations uh, they had some engine problems and it went off the end of the runway and crashed and uh, uh, fortunately the, uh, the two people that were on board there were no injuries but the airplane was totaled. They said uh, on uh, that day, Dr. Thompson, who hit, was uh, uh, managing the hospital at that time, sent an email out to people saying, the death of a dream, <laughs> titled The Death of a Dream. But they continued to pray about it, and uh, over the years, uh, the Lord brought uh, Steve Straw, who I worked with out there, um, with a Cessna 207, and they have continued to serve um, it, they actually are extremely busy with their one airplane out there, um, both doing medevacs, uh, oftentimes bringing in medical supplies that won't make that 10-hour rough road journey and different things like that. Uh, it's a, a constant operation for them. And uh, so they stay very busy. He's been there since 2008. The airplane in this photo in 2019 was taken down for corrosion. And so... Uh, Kind of a neat story. It went to its annual inspection and they said this plane has so much corrosion it can't, that it wouldn't be renewed for flying anymore. And uh, so SIL in Cameroon said, hey, we have a 206 that we're not using right now. And they sent down a 206 that they've been using. And in the meantime, the Lord has provided another 207 for them that is currently going through all the processes of being um, registered and taken through the airworthiness to serve hopefully soon. That's been quite a process for them. But um, most of you, uh, if you followed the notes, know the alternator story. Uh, three days, I think it was three days before I was to head out there, they called me and said, hey, can you bring an alternator out? It was kind of funny because just that Sunday I talked with Doug about how I was bringing a bunch of uh, equipment out because a lot of the times the easiest way to get stuff out there is, uh, is in your luggage. Uh, it just um, really is the easiest way to move a lot of uh, stuff out there. So I was bringing out some aircraft parts. I had a pump in there uh, for a, a fuel tank pump. I had uh, a prop governor. I had all kinds of stuff. And then I was joking with Doug. I said, well, at least they haven't asked me to bring an alternator out. The next day, <laughs> they uh, sent me, uh, sorry about that. They sent me an email said, is it possible for you to fit an alternator in your uh, suitcase? And I said, well, I can, I can try. We'll see what we can do. Apparently, the airplane's alternator went down the day before, and so they were grounded. And so uh, this alternator arrived three days later, and, and really I was quite concerned because that's a sensitive piece of equipment. You don't necessarily want to trust that to the airlines. But I packed it in there with as best as I could, and we just prayed that it would... 
make its way out there well. But the other concern I had is getting through customs and you got this big clunky piece in there and they're like, what are you doing with this there? And uh, just from my experience growing up, uh, getting through customs can be quite a hassle at the airport. And so I was really worried about this thing. Um, but in the end, uh, I went through a border and came up to the customs guy and I told them what I had and they're like, okay, and off we went. And it just was, it was a non-factor in the end. It absolutely, nobody was concerned at all. Uh, which was kind of funny. I had a, one of the nurses that was out there told me a story of when she came out there, she had some false arms in her suitcase for training up the nurses on, on uh, running IVs. So these things look really realistic. I, I've never seen one, but she said they're pretty realistic and you can pump fluids in there and all of that. And she's like, oh man, they stopped her and she's like, they asked her what it was what was in her suitcase and she told him she had two arms and it turned in this long thing they opened up her bag and here's these two arms that look very realistic and they're like oh! and <laughs> but uh, eventually the the whole story got out and they were able to get it but uh, in the end our alternator was on the airplane a few days later no issues at all um, so really appreciative of everyone that prayed for that and it was just neat how the Lord worked that out I wanted to um, pause for a quick second because of, uh, not really so much because I'm a Letourneau student, but to tell you of our, this community's impact to Gabon. And if you look in this picture, uh, you'll see a power station there on the Luetsi River. And I learned this story while I was there. So apparently way back in the, uh, I think it was in the early, late 50s, uh, some missionaries were at a church and they were presenting uh, their work in Gabon and someone asked if they had any prayer requests and they said, well, we're trying, we're working towards, we see a need for a hospital, we'd like to eventually uh, work towards that. Um, but one of the things out there is there's no electricity. It would be good if we could get electricity someday. It just allows us to do more in the facility and all of that. And uh, so that was one of the things. Well, there happened to be um, uh, a man there at that church named R.G. Letourneau, and he came up and asked them afterwards, what can I do? And uh, they told him, and basically he sent out uh, the turbine, uh, turbines and equipment uh, that were needed to build this power station that sits right next to the bungalow hospital. And uh, today, that power station, the mission turned it over to the Gabonese government. They said, we don't need to manage this thing. If you want it, you uh, run it. And I think there's some agreement where they, uh, basically the hospital gets to run on it for free because it's, uh, because it's their equipment. But essentially it's been updated since then, but this power station uh, provides electricity not only to the hospital, but to that entire region of Gabon. And it shows how uh, one person can impact the world um, without ever stepping in the country sometimes. And so just uh, the mark of obedience, it was kind of a neat story to learn about that uh, there. As far as my trip, I'm, I'm gonna go over uh, a few of the things that I did while I was out there. I did uh, an annual inspection. Airplanes have to be inspected uh, once a year um, for work like this. And that's, you basically take the airplane down, you open everything up and uh, you inspect everything to make sure that it's working good. Anything that's not within specs needs to be replaced. Um, it's just a way of keeping aviation safe. So this inspection was due um, on the aircraft when I arrived. They were, and so we, uh, we started in on Monday. I, I we told you I went down on Sunday, Monday morning we're out at the hangar and we started opening up the airplane. So the annual inspection was one of the, one of the things that we did while we were out there. But uh, my work turned out to be really varied, uh, which was great. I got to see a whole lot of different things. We did repairs on oxygen machines in the hospital, which I had never done in my life. Fortunately, there was someone there to give me good, in, good instructions on how to do that. And uh, I also was able to help them with some of their pilot training while I was out there, um, basically as a backup pilot to them while they uh, did IFR procedures and stuff. And then, uh, which is instrument uh, flight rules. 
And then uh, also while we're out there, we're preparing for the arrival of this uh, Cessna uh, 207, which has a turbo engine. So we're uh, going through the manuals for a turbo uh, engine on a Cessna 207 and writing uh, operating procedures uh, for that aircraft out there and how they would need to operate it safely and effectively in that environment. And then uh, spent a lot of time launching and recovering flights. Uh, there were a lot of times I didn't get to go with the airplane because once you get patients and doctors and, and equipment in there, there isn't much room left. And, but uh, I spent a lot of time running between the airfield and the hospital, uh, launching and recovering, refueling the aircraft. Refueling is much more of an ordeal out there. You roll out a, a, a drum to the airplane and uh, hand pump it into the aircraft. Uh, it was a good workout. <laughs> And then there were just a multiple, uh, multiple other tasks, even down to parts inventory that I did for folks while I was out there. It, uh, I, I came out there and I said, whatever you need me to do, I don't care. Just set me to work. It doesn't have to be uh, um, anything. Whatever you need done, just let me be a blessing. And they, uh, they set me to work on all kinds of stuff. I think they started seeing, where's this guy's breaking point? Let's see. Parts inventory is a really uh, mundane and, and difficult task, but it needs to be done. And uh, so we did it. And I was fine with that. Uh, this is the annual inspection on the uh, 206 that we did. That's, uh, that's one of the few pictures of me at work. Uh, if I'd taken Sarah out, we'd have a lot more pictures, but uh, I went out there by myself and I'm not very good at taking pictures, so I apologize for that. If you see all those fuel barrels in the back, those are, uh, um, those are the fuel barrels that we would be rolling out to the aircraft. We actually rolled those out and into a different facility. By the end of that day, I think I'd lost 10 pounds in water weight alone. But, uh, <clears throat> Uh, within, uh, uh, we, we were able to get the aircraft annualed in a week and a half, and within a few days of getting that annual complete, we had our first medevac. And uh, so I included some pictures of that. I uh, had some cool videos I wanted to upload on here, but they just don't work so well. But um, we had a patient who, uh, in this case, instead of being uh, medevac from somewhere in remote Gabon to the bungalow hospital. He was already had been brought into the hospital. He had a, a broken back from a rollover injury on a logging truck, if, if I get the story right, from the folks that were there. And uh, they didn't have a specialist for that there at the bungalow hospital. So we ended up uh, medevacing him from there to the capital city, which is Libreville, where, um, where he could get seen by a specialist on that. Uh, by the way, if you look, a 206 is a great airplane. It's an excellent workhorse, but trying to put a, a tall person in there with spinal cord injury was actually quite a challenge. <laughs> the other thing is, is even, uh, uh, it's quite hilly around there. The airfield is at the flattest point uh, that they have around there, but that in itself is a 15 minute drive from the hospital on some pretty rough roads. And we felt really bad for this poor guy. Um, but uh, we were able to get him to uh, his care in Libreville versus 10 hour by road. I don't think he, I don't think he would have survived that. I don't, I'm not a specialist on that, but um, an hour and 40 minutes by air uh, to Libreville and he was in, in the care of a specialist. So really an important work. One thing I wanted to point out uh, down here in the uh, lower left, uh, that person in the center that you can only see their back, that is David Skovdal. He's part of Samaritan's Purse. There's a few organizations that work there at the Bungalow Hospital. He's a surgeon, and apparently Samaritan's Purse has a program where they send out uh, folks that are interested. If they want to be involved in something like this, they will, for two years, give them a salary in a hospital uh, like the Bungalow Hospital. And that's, he and his family are out there under Samaritan's Purse with a salary, but it's a two year program. And what it basically does, it allows them to be involved in a work and to see that work. But at the end of the two years, they have to decide whether they're gonna stay with it or whether they're done a lot. Um, uh, talking to him, they really see themselves staying with it. If they stay with it, then they have to 
uh, go the traditional route of raising support and all that. The one benefit they found is that most of the time, these people have proven by then that, that they're committed to it because they've been out there for two years with that kind of work. Uh, another couple I met there from Sam's, uh, that was originally from uh, Samaritan's Purse was uh, the O'Connors. They had come out under that same program and uh, they have been there now for 10 years uh, separately. Um, once, once they saw it, they, 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 they couldn't leave it. And so it's kind of a neat thing. Um, I wanted to uh, give you a brief introduction to my church experience in uh, Gabon, and uh, I've wandered on quite a bit, so we'll try not to rush too much here at the end, but uh, church in Africa is a very uh, uh, interesting experience. Someone gave them a sound system. I don't know how many people have been in that, but if you give them a sound system, at least in Africa, that means it needs to be at full volume the whole time. And so... Um, I felt like I needed to have earplugs in there. It was so loud. Um, but it also was a really neat experience to see uh, the work that God is doing amongst these believers there. One thing that was interesting, and you don't see it in this photo here, is that, uh, that there are ladies in the middle of the aisle. Uh, Africa is, uh, most African cultures are very much on you. Respect your elders. And so there's some older ladies in the middle of the aisle, and if they catch you sleeping, they're going to come over and give you a tap on the shoulder and tell you to straighten up. <laughs> Here they were doing a, a children's presentation, and so those ladies had moved out of the aisle. But it was interesting. They sit there, and they keep an eye. And I saw them. They got the, some guy in front of me. She didn't like what he was doing, and she came over, and she kept, kept her eyes on him for a little bit. But uh, it's funny. Um, there was something else I was going to say on that, but I got distracted. But anyhow, it's, uh, it's neat what the Lord is doing around the world. In truth, my experience in Gabon, you find that the church that is there in a lot of ways is stronger than the church here in America. And I think that is a transition that we're seeing around the world, um, and, uh, and it was a neat thing to see. And so as we go and we look at these organizations, something I really wanted to, I meant to mention with Aviation Medical de Bungalow and what uh, the hospital is doing is, is they actually want, their end goal is to turn all of this over into the hands of African Christians. And uh, the Bungalow Hospital is already there. They, there, it's, it's run. Um, by uh, the, uh, Gabonese Christians. And uh, Steve Straw's vision for the aviation program is to be the same. Um, it's a huge challenge when you get into aviation and, and all that, but that is their goal, is to see that move into the hands of the local Gabonese rather than rely on missionaries from overseas to run those programs. Um, really was a neat thing to see. A couple of pictures to run you through while I was there. Uh, the first is just a sunset there. Um, Gabon is beautiful. It's not a place I would choose to go to, to be honest. It's a, it's a rough place to live. It's hot. And I, I was eaten alive by bugs every day. I, I, I grew up in West Africa, and I don't know that the, they have bugs there that I was not used to. And they did. Night and day, I felt like I was just getting eaten alive by these little things you put on the spray after a while you just live and eat <laughs> but uh, um, that being said it, it still was just uh, it really was fantastic to have the opportunity to be a part of that uh, the picture there were uh, doing run-ups on the airplane they actually let me uh, do a lot more than I thought they would, and it was uh, really a neat experience. Um, on one of the flights coming back from Libreville, uh, we had no, no one in the back, so they actually let me fly for a while. I am a, a pilot, but uh, I'm not a commercial pilot, so if there was a, a passenger on board, I wouldn't have had that experience. And then uh, one of the neat things there that was kind of fun for me, being a father, is that uh, they have... Um, the missionary kids that are there, they're, they're usually homeschool, but this year they had a teacher there, so they've been doing kind of like a one-room school room, uh, one-room class room school. Anyhow, I got to go in there, and they interviewed me. Ironically, on all the uh, questions they had for me, uh, is most of the conver conversation uh, was about my time in Antarctica, which 
I was like, what's all this fascination with Antarctica? And then I thought, well, it's so different from Gabon. They probably enjoyed that. It was kind of funny. Um, here's uh, me and Steve Straw uh, working on some of the oxygen machines uh, in the hospital. And then uh, just uh, a few other photos that I threw in there. This one down here in the corner, I, uh, I took that photo. I like to go for runs if I get the time. And uh, I took a, a, a run out one day and I spotted this house just kind of sitting in the middle of the jungle. There's actually people living in there. But uh, um, I thought, I want my kids when they start complaining about something to point out to them this is how other people in the world live. I think one of the things that really opens, opened my eyes again, and I grew up in this, but we live in luxury in the United States and it's good for us to take a moment and, and realize how good we really do have it here in America. And I really, it's, there's so many other, I wish I had taken more photos. <laughs> um, but uh, the way people live um, around the world and in different parts of the world in, in, in uh, really great poverty. And so I took that picture just kind of to show my kids, hey, if you ever complain about the house, this, this is what other people live in. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to roll this up because we're running out of time. But uh, my last day, I was supposed to depart uh, La Bamba for Libreville on, uh, uh, on a Saturday before my departing flight uh, out of Libreville the next Sunday night. So Saturday I would be flying up there. Well, that morning we got a medevac flight and I was supposed to be on this airplane. I took this photo because I was like, there goes my airplane. We'll see how this works out. <laughs> I was supposed to be going up to Libreville on this flight and uh, we, had, uh, um, we had a patient with severe head trauma. And so, um, so I said, well, Count me off the airplane. We had another doctor who had come out from Ohio for a week to do some teaching out there. And uh, he was on uh, Air France flight out of Libreville that night, so he had to be on there. And uh, we ended up with a very full airplane. We had, uh, we had uh, the pilot, two doctors, and this patient uh, with the head trauma, and then those giant oxygen bottles, which weigh a ton. And uh, so I happily gave up my seat so that they could uh, do this medevac and I really kind of wondered I was like well if anything goes wrong on Sunday um, I'll be giving Sarah a call and saying I'm not coming home as soon as I thought <laughs> um, the Lord worked it all out and uh, they were able to get this uh, this guy in good care uh, he needed a CT scan was one of the uh, top concerns and uh, they were able to uh, get him to a facility where they could do that and provide him the care that he needed um, and then the next day I flew out of uh, La Bamba, got to Libreville, and two hours later boarded Air France and off we went. So <laughs> it was uh, um, quite, a, quite a trip out. Um, I took this, uh, this is the uh, 777 that took me out of Gabon. Sorry, I didn't expect to get emotional, but um, this is the, the airplane, not in Gabon, this is the airplane in Charles de Gaulle after I've returned. Um, obviously, in Char uh, Libreville, the airport is smaller than uh, East Texas Regional. Their international airport is not a, a big facility by any means, but... Um, I didn't expect this. So I have a picture and you can see we arrived in Paris. We arrived in Paris, it was an overnight flight. We arrived in Paris at 5.55 in the morning. There's a lot of reflections in there and that's why I titled it Reflections because it really is something to go from the jungle of Gabon and within a matter of hours, you're sitting back in our civilization it makes us greatly appreciative for what we have, but also to be uh, renewed in our love and compassion for the people of the world who do not live the way that we live and who most definitely need the gospel of Jesus. And so 
uh, even since I've come back, just taking time to share with Sarah the experience and the time that I spent out there. But, um, but also to reflect on this and go, you know, within a few hours we can be whisked back to civilization, but it doesn't end the call of Christ on, on, in this case, on my life. It doesn't bring a closure to that. And for me, it is uh, most definitely a desire to, to be involved with taking the gospel and serving the, the church wherever the Lord would, would have that be. And uh, so <clears throat> that was really a big part of this that, uh, that came together at the end of this is, is just taking that time to reflect. You go through, I went through that whole time period and you just work, 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 work. And then I find that since I've come home, it's given me a lot of time to spend in reflection on um, what I learned out there, but also not to forget it and just put it as another experience that I've gone through, but as a call to action and a call to continue to respond in obedience to what the Lord has laid on my life and a vision uh, for our family uh, in, in missions, however that would be. I had more to, to uh, share on that, but uh, I will close this out here really quick with a couple of things. I like this quote from A.W. Tozer. He says, the world lives in such a time of crisis. Christians alone are in a position to rescue the perishing. We dare not settle down to try to live as if things were normal. There are a few needs they have out there. The T207 that I mentioned, um, they need to get, that's currently in Nairobi going through a whole series of inspections and they need to get paperwork and all the you know, stuff to line up so that they can get that airplane in country and start using it. It's slightly larger than the 206, does a lot better for moving patients. And uh, uh, so they have a lot to get through there. Uh, like any organization this, uh, these days, they have some, some needs at the hospital. Um, they need the, their current nurse that's heading up, t training up nurses there. Um, she is uh, nearing retirement. She's, she's um, going to be leaving in a year, so they need someone with a master's degree to, uh, to who'd be willing to go out there and continue the nurse's training program. And they also have that same requirement for someone in pediatrics. And, uh, and then as far as the Aviacion Medical de Mongolo, you might have seen it in a couple of pictures, but they, they have a wood hanger, which doesn't work so well in the jungle over time. Wood boars get inside and eat it up, so they're looking to actually someday hopefully be able to replace that. Um, but there's so many things, and ultimately um, as we as we look at this and as, as I've gone through this is just um, ultimately the call is for all of us to be obedient to Christ wherever he would have us, wherever he has led us, to continue to take the love of Christ to those around us and to serve the gospel of Jesus around the world. Um, <clears throat> One thing that has deeply impacted me is that as we come out of this age of COVID where we've lived in self-preservation, the call, the, the, the call to go, the Great Commission has not ended. And so we, um, we need to keep that at our forefront sometimes. We've been in a time where there's been a lot of hanging on to ourselves and making sure we're taking care of ourselves, but we need to take a look out. And that's really been an impact for me. I'm sorry to take too much of your time. I will remind you that in Gabon, ch church is usually four and a half hours. So if Jason goes a little bit longer today, we're good, right? <laughs> I'll close this out in prayer real quick. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions later today or however. Dear Heavenly Father, it's just a simple prayer. We thank you so much um, for what you're doing. We pray that you would be glorified in our lives, that we would... Uh, not be distracted from what you would have us to do. Help us to just obey and to glorify you wherever you put us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.